I am extremely excited <laughs> and honored, in fact, to be able to announce tonight to our spiritual flock and constituency here in Vancouver and the outskirts of Bogota that as I speak, starting tonight, many times I will be channeling for, for the spirit of that past illustrious religious leader, Elmer Gantry. <laughs> Pardon? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I've been informed that he was a fictional character. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait, okay, all right. If he does send us messages, I got it. If he does send any messages, we simply won't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. As the pitch of the torture increased, the prisoner was informed that from here on he had a choice. He could either talk to his torturers, talk to himself, talk to life, or go back to talking to his tormentors like everybody else, except this time, differently. The distinction between same as and differently is what ultimately separates the free from the not free mm -hmm. and back to the free again. Mm -hmm. If within the reading of a single page you can experience both deja vu and precognition, then you waste your time hanging around schoolyards. <laughs> you should learn to waste your time some other way. <laughs> Being made to think about things he'd never thought about before used to really piss this one man off, and rightfully so. Hey, I got it. Let's all distract the playground monitor and make a run for it. <laughs> yeah, but still, when the going gets too tough, Life will still have local conditions, pat men on the back, and reassure them that it's all right, and that they'll feel much better if they do bitch and whine at their own ankles, which they mistake for shackles. <laughs> Go on, let it out, damn it. Today's, so now if they don't go, I'll blame it on Elmer Gantry. <laughs> <clears throat> Today's helpful hint for the one and all and even others. One way to protect yourself from ever becoming more conscious is to continue to let people tell you what it is. And now an important message from your local fire marshal. Some things seem to make more sense than others, and if they do, don't play with them. Yeah, I'm with you. It's hard to tell whether he's being serious or not. Some makeup and cosmetic news. When in doubt, it's easier to put on lipstick and talk loud than it is to get un in doubt. <laughs> Some charitable news for which I trust you'll benefit. Man's collective institutions only award grants when they're sure they don't know where they're going. <laughs> and look at there, yet another sign by the mystic's own route to that extraordinary highway, this time one saying, take certainty, give certainty but mainly, just be steady and sure. Of course, you may by now have noted that the ordinary have similar signs on their roadways, but in their case, they believe it all has to do with physical behavior. Our understated tip for the day, having the mind under some control could be of some ultimate benefit. <laughs> In thought, same as in glass blowing, the key is in clarity and calm, deliberate action. Upon hearing this, one man became so oversight by incumbent that he began to venter hyperlate. <laughs> if you don't laugh at language, Language won't laugh at you. And if you believe that, you'd believe that Nante is saving up for a Lexus. 
<laughs> Within a closed system, everything eats its own, births its own, then eats its own again. Is it any wonder that people as smart as mystics always want to get the hell out of here? <laughs> According to one legend, life used to snack on corn fritters till it learned to deep fry men. <laughs> Thus are we left, young munchers, with the plain and glorious fact that the secret that few so seriously seek has got to reside either outside of ordinary reality or inside of a man somewhere past the normal reach of present awareness. Okay, for dessert, would anyone care for a new description of what more conscious explanations are? Okay, here it is. They're like jokes, the position of whose punchlines are unpredictable. One day life said to a man, want to play a game? The guy said, sure. And life said, okay, think of something you never thought about before. And the guy thought for a second and then said, ah, that's not fair. And life just laughed and said, pay the cashier as you leave and don't forget your hat. And the guy whined again, that's not my hat, that's my head. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> he with the right word can write a sentence, and he with the right sentence can write a paragraph, and he with the right paragraph can write a book. And he who awakens to all he's uh, written can stoke up his fire with the verbal dead wood. One man's personal precept was, you can read them fast or you can read them slow, but whatever you do, read them fast. Yeah. At a recent intergalactic medical conference, the subject came up of why you never hear mystics throwing up. Could it be that they're only ones whose mother always told them to go up your food? <laughs> the pugilistic arts got the idea for the 012 from the way in which the more conscious think. And professional wrestling came up with the idea of throwing matches from the same basis. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you don't get this one, don't bother asking your mind to explain it to you. In the spirit of equal time fairness from our last show, we present one man's response to a particular news item. Responds he, the great thing about the past is that it is so predictable. Oh ye of little memories. If I was a guest psychologist here on the show, I'd look at me and go, oh, come on and share it with us. <laughs> screw, screw you, Dr. Sisters. Today's legend. Ain't no cheap-ass psychologist going to tell me what to do. Unless it's her show. <laughs> Today's legend. There is a legend that says there was once a man who told others of a myth that said that life originally looks everyone dead in the eye once, briefly, and that most immediately look away and miss whatever opportunity it was available. But this legend goes on to present the question of whether or not it is actually everyone who has this experience or just a random few here and there. Yeah, I'm with you. It's this kind of legend that gives legends a bad name. One man adopted the motto, why worry? And in a surprise move, his brother countered with, why not? <clears throat> Each and every time he'd get married, this one man would have the same song played as he walked down the aisle, which went like this. And now to Dr. John X. Smith, a master's in medieval lit. And yes, as you probably guess, he'd also have it played every time he died. Me and the good doctor enjoyed it. <laughs> Collective thought is as beneficial to an individual as the Hormel brothers are to whole herds of cows. <laughs> and according to another legend, as man began to grow, life began referring to the buildings housing his common wisdom as libraries, compendiums inclusive of all mental nourishment, rather than by their original name of cookbooks on how to properly prepare human brains. One man looked deeply into the eyes of life 
And guess what he saw? Go on, guess. You don't want to guess? Okay, we'll go on. <laughs> it came to be that one man finally paused to ponder just what sort of non-standard justice might be afloat that made it, made it, that made it be that those people usually most vocal and physically anxious to take up some mystical path are also most likely to be least out. Hey, Tip, if you're going to the city, if you squinch up your ears real good, you can hear a lot less. To say, in the way it is normally handled, that the mind is a spontaneous, adventurous, free spirit is either a grand act of charity or stunted perception. Have you come yet to note that all of collective man's mythical heroes possess supernatural powers always of a physical nature only? Have you come yet to ask, where are the otherwise? And to answer, they are within you. The simple remain disposed to fear and worship death through legendary figures who physically overcome it, while the more alert in their private lives have replaced the concept of death with stagnant consciousness. One day, the royal carpet cleaner approached the king with this message. The greatest allegory ever known to man is the weather, which was not that distant from what his grace had been recently thinking regarding his own hormonal balance. <laughs> Upon hearing the axiom, it's better to wear out than to waste away, one man's mind made him immediately reach for a beer and the remote control. <laughs> <laughs> Sipping on his coffee while periodically glancing about, one climbing instructor noted to a friend, you know, the simple, simply scrambling about can seem kind of cute in a way. And allowing for a momentary pause, his pal responded, well, if you can make that read pathetically cute, maybe. Which said, and they both understanding clearly what was privately intended between them, they fell silent for a bit as they again reflected on how often aspects of out in the open reality have no attendant appropriate descriptions, even though it would seem that things most plain and obvious would be the first named. Mystical surveying is not linear, but routine blueprints are. Thus, any reading from same makes the former seem so. When anxious for egress from an uncomfortable cave or unfamiliar ledge, the simple will often began to proclaim passing eagles to be no more than carping ravens. <laughs> Those who know criticize none but themselves, and only then, when they're not home and deserve it. <laughs> As his semi-guiding light, one man assumed the slogan, when uncertain, don't be. <laughs> Playtime mystics like to hear about, hear about forms of their intrigue that are dead and gone of exotic backgrounds with something resembling a structured discipline and with just a hint of exclusivity. This, of course, <laughs> leaves those seriously interested in enlightenment with nowhere to go. <laughs> Is that a righteous riot? Righteous riot or what, Scott? One certain tabby had his own approach. When left outside in the cold and the snow, on caddies he'd perch, never on Porsches. One reason the awakened are so hard to find is that they so seldom go very far from home. It is a sagacious sailor who lends not his boat and the more alert who do not let the collective borrow their mind. How to identify people who do not know what they are talking about. They will, with urgency, assure you that it is most important for you to know what it is that they are talking about. <laughs> Literal thinking is to metaphorical as two dimensions are to three, and metaphorical thinking is to symbolic as three dimensions are to four. And beyond all of that is a form of awareness about which there is little to think. The question, why do men prefer, prefer to talk about the past? The answer, 
because they don't like surprises. Yeah. Next level. The question, just what is the awakening? Answer, the world's biggest surprise. Yeah. And now a wrap of one particular transcendental wrap. Reality itself is not linear, and since speech is, anything said about it is at least partially misleading. One man, as he had increasing doubts regarding the value of everyday chatter and small talk, began in public to often act dumb. You mean pretend he couldn't speak? Yeah, yeah that too. Yeah. The future, the one thing that doesn't have to be advertised or promoted. A man who had been interested in deep sea diving wondered why there were no stories about his activities since they are in fact the same as mountain climbing, except of course to linearly limited, spatially driven minds. Query, since it is like, since it seems like the intellect is the proper path to end a potential increase in consciousness, why not give it some special attention? You don't have to answer this right now. Reports from certain battlefronts and other places. How did it begin, he asked his friend, that so many believe concern for the body is the way to mental enlightenment? And his friend, being one to the end, replied, a simple man, when troubled, will always focus on that closest at hand. And yet the man still was perplexed, since the mind is as near man as any of his other parts. But that remains, but that remains the operational distinction between those to the unprofitably simple born and the few whose genetic wiring is such that things initially plain and simple soon reveal themselves as being much more complex and significant. One warrior survived many a spear and arrow only to be cut down by excessive modifiers, stipulations, uncertainties, and apparent local exceptions. And a certain correspondent covering the wars one day stopped and wondered why does man have the word manhandled and no other creature has a similar term relating to such behavior particular to themselves? The only note from that rare recruit back home to consciousness says, if I'm alive, I'll be there. And slap in the midst of all this, one guy up and mused. The really great thing about awakening is that no one can tell you just how to do it. Another blow struck for originality. <laughs> a story within a story, a life within a life, what is its name other than man? Back to that kind of non-linear, quote, 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 progress, evolution, to which I'd been referring that I was labeling as going from the literal to the metaphorical to the symbolic. And several attempts to the use of picturizations as Maypole and even tonight pointing out that there is a problem if you look at what seems to be some sort of progress some sort of movement as being spatially driven, being spatial in nature. If you do, you are severely limited at best and at worst, absolutely misled. But since speech is literal, then we're left with certain concepts. But rather than talking about, or rather than you think about, even when I talk about it, such things as the, some great march down a mystical path to awakening, or my allegory of turning the well-known Oriental Express and taking that as a metaphorical picture of a trip not just from Paris to Istanbul but from an ordinary state of consciousness to another state. All of those, without any doubt or they would not make sense to the mind at the literal level, they do, they are based on a literal, on a literal assumption and picture. That's the only way a train can get from Paris to Istanbul. That's the only way anyone can move down a road, whether we call it progress or not, 
It has to be based upon, as all speech is, a sense of literal sequence. And there is no perfect picture, but I was going to suggest when I was throwing in the confines, the distractions of sensing it being a spatial movement, you could look at it as being seeking another level, which has been used, and I'm not now trying to infer in some spiritual sense, but if we looked upon, now try and picture an infinite plane, or a sphere, the surface of a sphere which has no beginning or end, but just like an infinite plane if you want that, the universe stretched out, and as far as the mind can see, there is no beginning or end. And so you're not attempting to go in any particular direction. Let's say that you're attempting to go up to another level. Again, taking out any pseudo sense of a great rise and some kind of spiritual achievement, but just you're not satisfied here. And if the awakening, the ignition, the enlightening of consciousness to another level, it's a fair description. You understand going to another level, not to a point somewhere, but to another level in that sense, any aspect of it being a spatial movement is moot, to say the least, because it doesn't matter where you go, which is what I was also, anybody get that? If you're trying to go, if we're on this level and you're trying to go up here and it's infinite, as far as the mind can see, then to say, well, wait, am I in the right place to go up? It's foolish. If the whole point is oh, we're going up, there's another level up there, we're going up, and you go, well, all right, should I start here? Okay. <laughs> what would it be about over here? Okay. But, uh, well, wait a minute, you understand if, it's, if it is also infinite up here, the question about, well, now we'll get in the right position, you know. Should, should I convert to uh, Islam or should I become a Buddhist? Should I save my head? Yeah, yeah, okay. Should I let my hair grow? Okay. There is no spatial pertinence to any question about, well, where, do, where should I start? Which was also one of the side messages I was trying to impede, impel you, cut you with about what, a metaf what I was intending by metaphorical thinking, that you have the literal and back to a kind of two-dimensional picture, that if literal thinking is just a normal traffic flow, it uh, does not discriminate, it is not peculiar to one person to another, it has no pertinence to anything outside of itself, it is simply saying, there's the stool, well my God, would you repeat it, there is the stool, <laughs> what else is there, that's literal, it is, what's that got to do with us? What does that have to do with an individual man's perception, awareness, his consciousness? If all we're talking about, there's a stool, okay? All right, I see it, right there it is. Well, don't drive me crazy talking about it. That's it. Metaphorical thinking, which I was trying to describe, along with the ever popular hand gestures, the literal thinking is, here it goes. And metaphorical thinking is, tracking it, running parallel to it, never touching it. It is not interfering with it, and therefore, in the same, if you can picture, I've changed the, trying to drag that other allegorical picture I was taking on, that it's irrelevant to speak about if you're going to move in an infinite direction, in an infinite manner, or to an infinite possibility, in a direction just up from what is now an infinite plane, then to say, well, where do we start, is absolutely ridiculous. It's just meaningless got them for conversation. And in the same way to say, well, the ordinary people, when they hear the idea of some non-literal way of thinking, much less speaking, then they want to know, well, specifically what? If you say, well, there's a way in which you can take just ordinary thinking, and if you get them past the point of wanting to pick out examples, they go, well, what, are you talking about political, religious? And you go, wait a minute. Just, let's take ordinary thinking, just same everyday ordinary thinking and speech. And they go, okay. And you go, no matter what it is, there's a way in which you can think simultaneously, metaphorically about what's being said, what, what everybody else is thinking, and what you, at the everybody level, which everybody's got the everybody level, if you don't, you're not everybody. You're pork rinds, I believe they call it in the psychiatric trade. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Some kind of snack food.
<laughs> than ordinary people would want to say, well, wait a minute, I've heard about allegorical interpretations and I took a half a course in poetry and et cetera and back in college, but exactly metaphorical or allegor or metaphorical interpretations of what? And you go, well, every, everything, just, a, just an indiscriminate, non-interferential tracking of all just ordinary literal thought and you metaphorically are thinking along, just parallel to it, constantly. And they go, well, all right, yeah, I got a sensation of that. I'm an educated hip man, sophisticated, but wh what kinds? Rather than drag this into a deeper hole, you understand the ordinary mind because you've got it, it would say, well, I can understand some aspect of trying to make a, you know, here and there, an allegorical or metaphorical interpretation of what people are saying, but give me an example. What are you talking about? Because the mind cannot conceive of the fact of what I just said plainly of doing it continually. And it could defend its position by saying, well, what's the need in doing it? If you're doing it constantly, it loses all meaning or everything that's said doesn't need a metaphorical, doesn't have, doesn't deserve a metaphorical interpretation. If you're going to say, there's a stool, well, what kind of metaphorical interpretation is that? You know, they're going to try and turn it on me, trying to pull that kind of crap on me. Oh, I was. No wonder it almost worked. That was bottom of the page humor. No, I was Elma Gatcher again. I was channeling. No wonder it was frightening. <laughs> Metaphorical thinking, in the real sense that I'm intending it, is absolutely non-interferential. It is not selective. It is not prejudicial. It is not opinionated. It does not touch. And therefore, to ask, well, wait a minute, metaphorical thinking or interpretations of what has the same pertinence, the same pragmatic relevance as saying, all right, if we're trying to move up to another level of consciousness, where do we start? And you go, right. No, 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 where do we start? Don't be silly. Okay, start where you are. The person thinks, well, uh, that, that, that's obviously not going to do. Wouldn't it be better if I stood over here? And you go, okay, stand over there. <laughs> They go, maybe if I stood closer to you. No, I'd stand closer. Well, maybe if I moved over next to that mosque or next to that temple, or maybe if I stood over there and closer to a library. Go ahead. You understand, the mind has got to, at the ordinary literal level, for it, since it is sequential, and speech therefore also, it must finally say, well, what, what should I do? And I'm just being sort of, informally, in-house, funny, to do what I've just got through doing, but to play the part of an ordinary person. Say, well, tell me what to do. I'm real anxious. Can I start? Where should I start? Right here? And you go, sure. Or the funnier version. I like that. So, all right, I'm real anxious. I believe that I might be onto something here with you. So, tell me, where should I start? And you go, right. Correct. <laughs> Which I know sounds to be a non sequitur, but only to the literal-minded and the sequitur minded. But it is impertinent. And yet people say, well, come on, tell me something. You're just being silly. You're just trying to be theatrically vague. Metaf the real metaphorical thought has no actual contact with the literal thought. Now, finally, as promised, we're going to now privately reveal the actual in-scene measurements of Amy McPherson. No, it was Elmer Gantry. She didn't have an in-scene. Well, I didn't mean to get into that kind of cheap gossip. Into symbolic thinking, which also for those of you that I saw one or two Tin Waters, maybe last time sort of momentarily got up to look like to me like 25 or 30 watts. <laughs> if you'd like to go into another pictorial realm from mine, my triumvirate of the non-sequential, non-linear progress of going from literal to metaphorical to symbolic thinking, 
I gave you one into the another era of the electromagnetic spectrum of saying that a parallel to that would be going from the invisible to the red, or to the blue, to the yellow, to the red. In this case, I threw in a fourth one, which I'm going to do with thinking anyway, and then back to the invisible. That's the kind of non-linear progress it is. Think about it. See, I could say going from literal speech, how about this? Yes, I'm going to get back to symbolic. <laughs> Let's ain't kill another 25 minutes for this. Let's take it that my original presentation of, let's take it speech, makes it sound more physically comparable. Going from silence to literal speech to metaphorical speech to symbolic speech and back to silence. Going from the invisible to the blue to the yellow to the red back to the invisible. Strike back. Mm -hmm. But there you go with speech. I mean, it doesn't matter. Every now and then I do it for you people's benefit. to say, well, strike back because it's not really back, which is the one tonight that drew so many blanks, the difference between same as and differently. <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> okay. The difference between the same as and differently. Yes. <laughs> But see, once you understand that all speech is linear, and therefore whatever it depicts having to do with reality is at least in part misleading, then I don't have to go back and clean up these sentences for the sake of your little baby burgeoning consciousness and say, well, I'll strike back. It's not actually back. Hell, it ain't actually anything. You're supposed to have known that. <laughs> clean up your own sentences. It's your playpen. <laughs> as we say in the neural nursery, she got your own diapers. <laughs> now, I knew I didn't want that guy staying close to me anyway when he asked about, would it be better to stand over here? I went ahead and said, well, yeah, okay. And what I wanted to say was no. <laughs> no if you don't mind, you're better off where you are. Your first guess was right. <laughs> Going from the literal to the metaphorical and now to the symbolic. And if you recall the operational distinction I originally gave a few nights back when I started this was that the literal is just literally what it says, that there's a stool, and then metaphorical thinking would be that which you're saying one thing and you intend something else. But, you know, boy, that Fred is lucky. Uh, he's got more lives than a cat. You remember that? And you do not mean that he has more lives than a cat because a cat has the same number of lives as everybody. You do not mean that literally, but any fairly verbally sophisticated person understands that you're making a metaphor, that you're saying one thing, but you intend something else. The sentence makes sense, but everyone with ordinary intelligence understands that that is not what you mean. Symbolic is where what is said can also be, could be what is meant. I mean, the one I used of, boy, that Fred is, or he has got more lies than a cat, the sentence cannot be literally true to begin with. So you've got to mean something else if you are sane. Whereas if you said, uh, when the cat's away, the mice will play, you can say that literally, having to do with rodents and what you may have as a feline form of rodent control at home vis-a-vis -vis it off on vacation, him or her. So in the symbolic sense, what you say can be literally true, but can also be otherwise as contradistinctive from metaphorical. Symbolic thinking then is a kind of other step, and I can say upward, sideways, again reminding you in a non-lineal sense, it is a kind of progression that if you get to the point, you can't really go from one to the other because I've already pointed out, not because I pointed out, but I, why do I have to go back and strike that for you? We've just been through that. You know it's not because of. We just, you know, it's palaver. Albeit, albeit, very strange, I mean, a sophisticated palaver. <laughs> Something to do until the bus comes. 
remembering, of course, in our sense, the bus is atomic fueled mm -hmm. and not limited by spatial concerns. No one, generally speaking, no ordinary person, no matter the degree of sophistication, education, there's nothing him to do with postnatal environment and influences that can make one be able to think continually in a metaphorical manner. Cannot be taught is just, just whether you're lucky enough, like some people walk down the street, like downtown Manhattan or Paris, for 20 years and nothing happened, and one person walk along just one time, the first time in town, and a safe fall on them. It's just a matter, you could say, of genetic luck. <laughs> no, you straighten it out. There's no way that a person simply learns how, can adopt, can be converted to, can be taught how to think metaphorically, continually, even if they wanted to be. You can either kind of stumble around and you realize you're doing it or you're not. That is what I was describing, that you realize in the privacy, as you people in Oslo like to put it, in the privacy of your own head, you are continually saying down to earth every day, walking around kind of guy, that you understand what's going on in life. The literal thought, the kind of literal ticker tape running through everybody's head is still running through yours. You have not mucked it up enough with drugs and alcohol and wrapping your head up in strange accoutrements with jewels and strange marks on them, which I must give everybody credit. I, sometimes I throw in little things about wrapping your head up with a towel or a turban and kind of make light of it, but if you can't really seem to have any sort of super conscious or metaphysical experience any other way, it is cheaper than drugs. If you just take, you know, like a Get, go buy a turban the tur and get, get one at least two sizes too small and get it down and keep it. I mean, it's according to what you will accept as being a mystical experience. <laughs> it's very little known, but there's in fact a group of people that one time wandered the northeastern forest of India claiming to be upon some great mystical, or on the verge of some great mystical discovery, and it turned out it was just a group of migraine headaches. It was a support group. Yeah. <laughs> and that metaf metaphorical thought cannot be taught is not something that you can be recruited to. To take it now another step, remember, not sequential, not linear, but another step beyond that is symbolic thinking. If I'm telling you a fact that it's less than 1%, ha, of anybody on this, the population of this planet at any given time has the ability that the, the ticker tape, the flow of ordinary mental, literal traffic continues to run, they're aware of it, and they're no longer criticizing it, they're no longer arguing, wrestling with it. It's going on, it's like them watching a movie, and in a sense, the part of them watching the movie has no comment, but now they've got another kind of comment, they've got another kind of viewer who is non-spatial. He is not, he or she is not sitting in a theater. You've already got the person watching the movie. That's literal, ordinary, sane thought. That is what is normally referred to as a man's con uh, personality. You've got that going. You can never fool with that profitably. No, the truth is you can't fool with it. It's only Dr. Schmachter and her sisters and brothers and ordinary psychologists and religious people who believe that you can. Well, them and everybody else that believe that you can. Well, I can change my personality. Well, why don't you? That's a dirty question. You shouldn't do that to people. Not unless they're close family members and that you can, and you can whip their ass. You cannot change a man's personality. But, of course, that's part of life's, again, safety clutch is that ordinary people will say, well, you're crazy. Anybody can change themselves they want to bad enough or if they get professional help. God, I hate, it's terrible standing here in public to make such a continual ass out of oneself, but having nothing else to lose. <laughs> On we press. You have the part of you which I'm referring to now as literal thinking. 
the part of you that you have given up or you realize the futility, you realize that there is nothing to be gained if you could interfere with that. Because all it amounts to is would be you, if you, if you, there was any possibility that you could interfere with the literal thought, which I'm off time just referred to as a collective thought of man. To look out, which all ordinary people do. They go, wait a minute, some of life may be all right and et cetera, but a whole bunch of crap that's going on is nothing but crap. A whole bunch of things that people believe, of all stripes, all persuasions, is just, it is absolutely incorrect and probably dangerous. I wish they'd listen to me. You understand, even if you were so misled to believe that there was some possibility of you affecting what's going on out there, look at it this way. Seriously. It's you against six billion people minus one. Now, I know that there are people in the world that have, or so I hear, a quite fine opinion of themselves, but you're pushing it. I mean, you are pushing it. Everybody needs a hobby, and I believe, you know, we all like to pull out our little golden book and read about the little choo-choo that thought he could, but goddamn, give yourself a break. Even if there was any chance that you, and of course you'd be inclined to start off and say, you and you alone, see much of the folly of human life. And you can just no longer sit on the sidelines passively and let this kind of insanity continue without comment. So even if you're correct, which you're not, but even if you're correct, which you're not, but even if you're correct, which you're not, and you decided, well, I'll try it, which is a waste of time, but you thought, I'll try it, which is a waste of time, but you thought, well, I'll try it, which is a waste of time. <laughs> Given all that, and for you people over here, that notwithstanding, <laughs> given all that, consider this. Even if all that, if I give it to you, it's you against six billion people minus one. You're going to make that little choo-choo go hide his head in shame. <laughs> Not really. You're going to make pork rinds feel better. <laughs> you're going to make, make them feel like they done been enlightened <laughs> compared to you. <laughs> right, back to where we were. <laughs> Metaphorical thoughts has nothing to do with interfering with literal thought, has nothing to do with criticism. You understand, it literally, it would be as though, back to the literal thought, would be like you originally, you and everyone else who are, who are sane, that you are sitting like in a theater and you're watching. We're speaking intellectually, of course, we're not talking about the physical survival level and hormonal level of man insofar as our discrete-based conversation. That there you sit, you were born there and you're sitting in a place and you're watching this or reading the news, the wire go through your head, but let's assume that you're sitting there in a theater, there's your seat. John X. Smith, Jane X. Smith, your seat is 5,600,000. So you got a seat, if you call that being an individual. You got your own seat in the damn theater, okay. You cannot move from that seat, unless you're ordinary and then you think you can. But you cannot move from that seat there's nothing, you can't move, there'd be no profit in moving if you could. Because you can move, if you could move from one seat to another, they're still playing the same goddamn picture. So, what the hell have you accomplished? Well, that's like saying, well, I used to be just a cheap, homeless, drunk in the gutter, drinking mad dog. But I finally, I sort of pulled myself together and got a job, took some night courses, and now I drink nothing but gin. Good gin. <laughs> Even if you could move, they're still playing the same movie. That would be a man's ordinary personality. That would be what I am describing as literal thinking. There you are, and you just finally realize without me having to raise my voice and all these gestures, because it doesn't matter. You either realize it or you don't. Metaphorical thinking would be almost as though you have now risen in a non-spatial sense, but that you've almost risen to a non-existent, or heretofore in you, a non-existent balcony. It's like you're floating above the theater, or that you're, you're, not, you're outside the main floor. Right now, I'm not saying better or worse, and it implies no great spiritual breakthrough. We're still talking about the human nervous system. 
This is metaphorical thinking. This would be metaphorical viewing of the movie, a metaphorical awareness. Not moving back to one specific seat in this new balcony I've just made up. It's not getting one spot and going, well, wait a minute, I don't like parts of that movie, or I don't like the way it looks from this seat. You're now not confined to a seat. You've got no comment about the movie. Now, downstairs, where you originally sat, I'm not saying that that side of your nervous system does not still make noise, which is the whole point of those who even know what they're talking about in the least sense, is what the attempt to meditate oneself into some kind of serenity of the mind, to calm the mind, as the, many of the Eastern disciplines wanted to call it. Down there, it's not going to happen. The, the one of you, the literal thought, sitting down there on the original floor of the theater is never going to get calm. Now, there are ways to describe it, but it's never going to get calm. It is never going to quit thinking like it does. If it did, you'd hate it. You would be this month's poster boy for poor crimes. <laughs> you do not want that. But, well, plus, it won't happen. So we're not talking about stopping it. We're not talking about going down and trying to throttle your old self and say, wake up, damn it. Whew. Talk about a waste of time. You say, come on, come on, can't you see what you're doing? Well, yes, I can see. And all it thinks is, get your hands off of me. <laughs> you weird person in an overcoat I've never seen before. You know, leave me alone. <laughs> don't you know what you're doing? Certainly I know what I'm doing. Just don't ask me, but I know what I'm doing. I'm watching a movie. Now, being me, here in seat number five million seconds right around. So now you have two things going. You have the one down here, the literal. It never changes. It can't change, nor should it change. It's just there. You now have a parallel and to ever getting where it's got to be, not just spasmodic. I know you don't start off and you do it all the time. The reason I finally brought it up after all these weeks and months and years is some of you now have the ability and you never had a term for it, that now it gets close to being a running, kind of different, silent commentary, a kind of parallel thinking to what's going on. And that no matter what other people say, you're past the point now of any sense of irony, sarcasm, criticism. You just hear other people talking about, well, if we do not pass the budget this week, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to our defense strategy. You're no longer going, nye, 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 or making fun of it, going, well, those damn Republicans, those Tories, those Whigs, those fascists, those Catholics, those Jews, whoever it is, you're no longer interested in that. You hear it, and you know it for what it is. And you, you have no comment. The one sitting down on the floor may be still yakking about it. But hell, you still make very rude noises in your stomach, even when you're at the opera and dressed up <laughs> and trying to impress somebody. The truth be known. Down here, you still make extremely rude noises. So does literal thinking. <laughs> it is not going to stop. Well, it will stop at the same time your digestive system stops making noises. Yeah. <laughs> now, I assume everybody understands that. In other words, we'll be out there shortly, according to our religion, whether it be Christian or Shinto, we'll be bringing to you in our visits either flowers or bowls of rice. <laughs> and you can call that, well, I am more conscious now. <laughs> which we've been through that. That's one of the definitions that they don't care for of ordinary people is that they can, in a sense, die and become more conscious. <laughs> Even the stool didn't want to think about that. And I, and I apologize because he didn't ask for it. The metaphorical thinking would be a kind of intermediate step into now what I'm trying to call, or going to call, symbolic thinking, in which, God forbid, <laughs> I, I hate to point this out, but you'll find out soon enough. <laughs> Elmer Gantry, the spirit thereof, took all of our time away. It's his fault. Symbolic thinking is something else. Now, in the same way that metaphorical thinking of you being having a kind of or having a neural awareness that is no longer sitting down there where you were born, where you and everyone is born. Forget all ideas about heredity, I mean about environment, about impacts postnatally against, uh, forget any notion of there being any valuable 
influence change possible down there on the main floor in which we're all born watching that movie. It cannot be done if anything resembling change happens down there. It is not a boon. It is a bust. It is harmful. Now, it's not just my opinion. They put people away when that happens. And it does happen. But they are anomalies. Healthy people can't change down the floor. No matter what they are. If they're healthy people, they're not mutants and anomalies. They cannot change. Metaphorical thinking, what I want you to see is the relationship now between what I'm calling metaphorical thinking floating somewhere that is nonspecific. That compared to metaphorical thinking is to literal thinking now in a sense as symbolic thinking is to metaphorical thinking. It is even less specific, if possible. It is even less judgmental. It is even less inferential. It is even less literal, which, of course, we already established metaphorical is not literal, but the metaphorical is to the literal as the symbolic is to the metaphorical. It is even less literal, except for this. I already said that it means two things. So you can't say, can you? Here I go, picking on me again. That I already said it means what it says and something else. So it is specific. Well, all right, yeah, you kind of caught me. Damn. <laughs> but remember, uh, for those of you who want a hint to hold over till next time, when I will again promise to faithfully pick up the subject finally, of symbolic thinking in some meaningful, substantial manner that you can take home in a coker bag, yeah. or maybe at least a pint. <laughs> take the description, the, other, the alternative I gave you of going from the invisible, or going from, how about from the silent to the literal to the metaphorical to the symbolic and to the silent are from the invisible to the blue to the yellow to the red to the invisible. The symbolic is not an end. Now, I started off a few nights ago as we commenced this of pointing out of using the progress in thinking, albeit nonlinear of going from literal to metaphorical to symbolic. I just left it at that, like symbolic would be it. Symbolic is not an end. It is not the end. But uh, consider the reason I've taken so long for one reason, other than the fact that I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Poor you people got, it's almost happened to your sense of humor, <laughs> especially since some of you now begin to resemble That was a compliment. <laughs> it's a symbolic in the way in which I gave the setup, which sounds as though it's leading all the discussion of the literal and the metaphorical. And the symbolic is like getting up somewhere to go, aha! Uh -huh. It'd be some kind of metaphysical flasher, like, all right, here's what you mean. Here is the symbolic. It, it is not an end. What makes it of some importance, just between certain few peoples, what can make it of interest is that it draws one so close, it is like the entryway to originality of thought, which I started out, if you recall, even before this idea of a progress from the literal to the metaphorical to the symbolic types of thinking, it already presented you with a notion that originality could be presented also as a true mystical discipline, as a true mystical method and discipline. Simply originality is the way I put it first time, but now we can be a, more, a bit more specific, which you should have known it already, is originality of thought, not originality of the way you stand, the way you do your hair, the way you dress, originality of thought. Symbolic thinking draws one ever ever so close.
to originality of thought. Literal thinking, far away. Metaphorical thinking, closer. Symbolic thinking, mucho closer. And now you can have the additional time between now and two seconds and the next time we meet and consider, all right, how would symbolic thinking be so much closer to originality of thought? You can either do that or, those of you that prefer, if you'll look under your desk, if you'll go home and try and connect the dots, which will, I'll tell you now, create a reasonably facsimile of a sketch of Elmer Gantry. <laughs> and anyone who colors theirs next time can get additional credit. <laughs> now, we'll take recess now, so but when you go out, be sure don't be pushing each other down. <laughs> and don't be stealing one another's lunch. <laughs>